Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Reptile and Amphibian Day. Woo! Okay. Okay, half of you are excited to be here, but that's okay. We'll work on the other half of you. I'm going to go ahead and start with the safety briefing. So, if you are sitting in an aisleway, you can't. You have to get out of the way. Because what are next to me are actually venomous lizards. We have two highly trained, very skilled technicians. These two have been working with animals like this for a long time. So it's the smallest probability that something bad is going to happen. But Nick, are these wild animals? They are wild animals. They are wild animals. So anything could happen. If something does happen, they need to be able to leave quickly. If they're on this side of the stage, they're going to go this way. There can't be anybody in their way. And if they're on that side of the stage, they got to be able to go out that aisle way to exit the theater, just so that everyone is aware. Can we do that? Okay. Second, third floor, you're good. You could stay where you're at. If they're running up there, it's gone really wrong. And not because of the lizards, I think. Well, welcome to Reptile and Amphibian Day, everyone. My name is Chris. I'm the curator for the Daily Planet Theater here at the museum. I get the pleasure and privilege of welcoming everyone to our special events and introducing the cool and incredible people that work here in the museum to bring us nature and science every single day of the week. And you are here, or you're watching online, for a live lizard feeding. So the theme animals for this year's Reptile and Amphibian Day are lizards. And here in North Carolina, we actually only have a few species of lizards that live in the state. So we've gone outside of the state to find some of the really, really, I mean, we have cool ones here too. But we have two amazing species of animal here today, and we're going to try our luck at giving them their lunch. Does that sound exciting? Okay, I hope so. I hope you think this is cool. Let me introduce the two other people who are on stage with me. They are both curators of terrestrial exhibits here at the museum. So you'll see these two taking care of the live animals that live here in the museum. We have Nick Allen and hey. Jeff Meddy. And then we have two lizards. I'm going to let Nick introduce them. Jeff is here to help Nick and make sure that everything goes according to plan, working with live animals. And Nick, I'm going to turn the stage over to you and let us learn about the animals you brought today. All right, thanks, Chris. So first, on my left, we have a Gila monster. Heloderma suspectum is the scientific name of this animal. And this is a medium to large sized lizard that lives in the American Southwest and in northern Mexico. These animals occur from southern Utah down through the Four Corners states and into northern Mexico. And then this animal over here on my right is a Mexican beaded lizard. And, and as their name implies, they're found predominantly along Mexico's west coast and extending down into the northern part of Guatemala. And their scientific name is really cool. It is Heloderma horridum because someone apparently thought they were really horrible when they first discovered them. So you can see that the beaded lizard is, is a bit larger of an animal. And Part of that has to do with this really long tail that he's got. When he turns around, you'll be able to see. And he actually uses that tail. It's called a prehensile tail. He can move it very well, and it helps him to climb trees. Because what this lizard does is he spends about half of his year climbing trees and raiding bird nests during the rainy season in these seasonal forests where he lives. So during the other half of the year, he's usually kind of curled up underground because it's, it's really too dry for a lizard to have a whole lot of fun outside during that part of the year. And maybe at that time, he's eating kind of a wider variety of beetle grubs and anything that he can find down on the ground with him. But during the rainy season, he is really into bird eggs. And part of the reason maybe for that is that you can see that these are not very fast animals. They look pretty calm and slow and deliberate right now, and this is actually about as fast as they ever move. When we put food in there, you'll see they get pretty excited, and they really don't speed up much past this. So these animals are not going to be very good at chasing things that can run away from them, and that's why they do a lot of digging up other reptile eggs that are buried in the ground 
or climbing trees to find bird eggs that are up in nests. Now, on the other hand, the Gila monster is very similar. It's also a slow animal that uses its tongue to find food, predominantly smelling the air. They smell with their tongue the way a snake does. You may notice that their tongues are coming out. They're tasting the air, trying to tell if there's any food around. And this is another animal that does a lot of digging, going to look for tortoise eggs and iguana eggs, and uh, also climbing into low shrubs for bird eggs, but they're really not nearly as good a climbers as the beaded lizards are. They're also just generally a smaller lizard, and like the beaded lizard, they spend a lot of their time hiding. More than 85% of their time in the wild is spent underground because they live in deserts. And, you know, surprisingly, they're not very good at being out in the hot sun in a dry environment. So they pretty much wait underground until it rains, and then they come out and look for food. And it doesn't rain very often in the desert, does it? So today we are going to feed them their natural diet that is going to consist a lot of bird eggs and of some very small baby rodents that we are not going to feed to them live because we do generally avoid feeding live animals to other live animals here at the museum. So what we're going to do first is kind of mix all of that food up into a bowl for them and then put it into the lizard cages. And then as the lizards spend some time eating that food, we'll have the opportunity to answer questions. So first, we're going to move one of these animals to the floor, and we'll start mixing up some food for both of them. So here at the Museum of Natural Sciences, we have quite an impressive collection of animals that are used for education. You can see a lot of those animals That's on exhibit throughout the museum. For example, on the second floor of this building, the Nature Research Center, there's an exhibit of milk snakes. You can go over to the third floor of the Nature Exploration Center on the other side across the bridge and see an exhibit of the venomous snakes that live in North Carolina, as well as lots of fishes. And then you can go into the Living Conservatory and see the sloth, which isn't a reptile or amphibian, so I won't talk about it that much. But here, as part of our living collections, the things that are alive in the collection in the museum, we have more than a thousand, I think, individual animals that are under the care of the folks who work at the museum, like Nick and like Jeff. Cool. So Nick, what exactly are you mixing up for us right there? So each of these two animals is going to get one chicken egg scrambled but still raw. And you'll notice that when they go to eat the egg, the egg is actually their favorite part. That egg yolk is what they really like to eat. And you'll notice that they kind of stick their tongue out and lap the egg yolk out of the bowl the way that, you know, maybe your dog at home laps water out of a bowl. Uh, somebody actually once compared their tongues to um, forks and spoons in a poem that I, I don't remember the rest of. But... The other things that we have in there, we have two quail eggs for the beaded lizard and one for the Gila because the beaded lizard's a little bigger, so he gets more food. And you'll probably get to see them swallow those quail eggs whole. Now that sounds like it would be kind of hard to do swallowing a whole egg without, you know, cooking it or cracking the shell. And they do eat the eggshell, but it's actually a very good source of calcium for them. So they really like, and, and they're really made for eating eggs. And then the... Gila monster is also going to get three very small mice, and the beaded lizard will get two small rats, because the beaded lizard, well, rats are just his favorite. He actually doesn't like to eat mice very much, and the, the Gila's don't like to eat rats. And that may sound kind of weird, because, you know, a lot of the time we look at rats and mice, and we think that they're kind of very similar, but apparently they smell really different to snakes. Dietary preferences like that are really common in a lot of the snakes and lizards that we keep. So their sense of smell and their sense of taste smell mm -hmm. with their tongue smelling what's going on around them can tell the difference between rats and mice, and they have preference. Absolutely. That's really cool. That's really special. Let's get started. All right. Um, you want to take a mic? So these animals are venomous creatures, which is why you won't see hands 
and human body parts going into the enclosures with the animals. We want us to stay safe just as much as we want the animals here at the museum to stay safe as well. So we'll see how long it'll take our beaded lizard to find the food. But Nick, I'm noticing that the beaded lizard looks a little bit flaky. What exactly is going on? So these animals shed their skin, uh, as all reptiles do. But in some of these larger burrowing lizards, instead of shedding their skin all at once the way a snake does, they shed it in pieces. Yeah, right now, he can see through this clear container, and so that's probably why he's looking that way. Uh, he's trying to figure out if he can get out, so I'm actually gonna maybe move this bowl a little bit and get it closer to where he's looking. Hmm? Sometimes they get distracted. Um, do you want to do the Gila? Yeah. So we'll go ahead and give the Gila monster some food too and see who figures it out first. All right, we have, a, we have a race. We could call it a hunger game. Thank you very much. Your tax dollars paid for that one. So Nick, tell me, how often do we feed these big lizards that live at the museum? So believe it or not, these animals, you may notice how thick the Gila monster's tail is. They store a lot of fat in their tail. And because they come from a desert ecosystem where food is very sparse, they're actually made to eat a really big meal very infrequently. So we feed them a lot of food like this every other week. These animals only eat once every two weeks. So would they get, so the Gila monster gets three mice, two quail eggs, and a scrambled egg. So we actually give a, a little bit of a more varied diet. So this is one example of what we feed them, but sometimes we'll feed them day old chicks, uh, chicken chicks for the beaded lizard and quail chicks for the, the Gila monster. Uh, sometimes we'll feed them more eggs, sometimes we'll feed them more mice and less eggs. We, we do like to mix it up a little bit just for the sake of variety for these animals. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question. With captive animals, I know you wanna give them mental and physical challenges just to keep them in shape and keep their mind sharp. Enrichment, mm -hmm. so what kind of enrichment do you do for the captive lizards here at the museum? Well, for these animals, a lot of it is burrowing. We give them a large enclosure. Each of these animals lives in an enclosure that is about four feet by four feet by about another two feet deep. And it's got enough substrate in it, dirt essentially, that they can construct a burrow. It's got logs for them to climb around in, hollow logs for them to hide inside of. And then each of these animals actually also lives with another lizard of the same species. So they get a little bit of social interaction as well. And are these common species in captivity? Would we see these at any zoo that we might visit in the US? They are relatively common in zoos around the US, zoos and museums. Uh, Gila monsters more so than beaded lizards. Um, I don't know any exact numbers, uh, but they are fairly commonly exhibited in most places that have desert exhibits. So maybe we should talk about how big their brain is. <laughs> Not that a Gila monster would encounter a glass bowl in the wild. But since you bring it up, most reptiles 
do not have a very well-developed brain when compared to mammals. So it takes them quite a bit longer to solve problems than something like a, a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a bird. It looks like we have success. <laughs> Our Gila monster has found the food. And I, I probably should go ahead and say that our Gila monsters here at the museum, we have two Gila monsters in the terrestrial exhibits unit, and we have two beaded lizards as well. And the Gila monsters are sort of the more friendly animals that, I wouldn't say they really enjoy being around people, but they definitely tolerate it a little bit better than the beaded lizards do. So it is possible that even though this beaded lizard probably is hungry today, he may just be a little too nervous because there's so many people here watching him eat and he's not used to that. A shy eater. And of course these animals wouldn't be coming across huge groups of people. They're sneaking around mm -hmm. in order to find food. So this wouldn't be the most natural setting for sure. Right. These are animals that, that often are pretty solitary in the wild and, you know, it's actually kind of infrequent for them to encounter other lizards and almost never to encounter people. Uh, interestingly enough, in the state of Arizona, it is illegal to pick up a wild Gila monster. Illegal to pick one up. So what this lizard is doing right now is he's got his head tilted back to help kind of use gravity to help swallow the egg that he's scooped up into his mouth. Is there a particular reason why? Like, I don't have to tilt my head back when I swallow my food. Why does a Gila monster have to do that? Well, part of it, when they're eating whole eggs, one of the things that they'll do, one of their behaviors, is that they'll actually grab the egg very gently in their mouth and then tilt their head back and then crush the egg so that the yolk runs out into their mouth instead of down onto the sand in front of them. Let all of that good food just run right down their throat. So Pretty smart. I'm, I'm gonna, a lot of energy. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually going to try and see if I can't encourage this beaded lizard to take some food by offering it to him on the end of these long grabbers that we have, which I think these are for getting cans off of a high shelf or something, but they're actually a great tool for working with venomous reptiles. Uh, you may notice also, as Jeff takes the lid off this cage, that we have handles on the top of the lid so that it's not as big a deal with these lizards, but if there was a large rattlesnake in that box, the lid actually becomes a shield as soon as you pick it up. Sounds like a good use for it. I can really see what you meant when you said they're not the fastest moving animals. And I suppose living in desert and desert-like environments, saving energy is really helpful.
So if there's anyone who's just now joining us, we are trying to feed a Gila monster and a beaded lizard their dinner. Their dinner, in fact, for the next several days. Mm -hmm. So you notice how this animal's having a little bit of trouble with this rat pup. This is what we mean when we say that these lizards typically only eat things that can't run away from them. Uh, any animal that's large enough to run away from the lizard has a pretty good chance of escaping. And so it, it's kind of interesting that these animals are venomous because they don't eat anything that needs venom to subdue. This isn't like a rattlesnake that is trying to take on a rabbit once every six months. This is an animal that, as long as he's able to find eggs, he can just walk up to them and eat them. So tell me a little bit about the venom of these, <clears throat> excuse me, two different kinds of lizards. What, uh, what sort of symptoms would you see if you experienced a Gila monster bite? Well, it's interesting. We, uh, we know much more about Gila monster venom than we do about beaded lizard venom. And the interesting thing about it is that it seems to look a lot like a lot of sort of our digestive hormones. In fact, one of the major components of Gila monster venom, uh, exendin, is very similar to insulin. And it actually was used by a drug company here in the Triangle, I believe, um, to develop the drug Bayetta, which is a type 2 diabetes drug. Uh, it's a, a sort of a synthetic insulin that was developed based on this component of venom found in the Gila monster, and it's a much longer acting drug, I believe, than natural insulin is. As a result, most of the symptoms of the bite include um, low blood pressure, low blood sugar, I think one of the worst accounts I've read was someone who passed out almost immediately. But most people report symptoms like pain, feelings of lightheadedness. Um, the general consensus is that while you should always seek medical attention for a venomous reptile bite, Gila monster bites are generally not considered to be life-threatening. And again, we know a lot more about Gila monster venom than we do about beaded lizard venom and my understanding is that fewer people are bitten by beaded lizards, and I haven't gone looking for a whole lot of literature on beaded lizard envenomations, but I haven't seen much either, so I, I think those bites are, are quite a bit more rare. In general, though, I don't guess people have much to worry about. No one should no. be afraid of these animals. Right, and there are a lot of stories about these animals, especially in kind of the old Wild West type era, but they're generally considered to be greatly exaggerated. Some of the stories say that they're 10 feet long and will pull you into rivers, and, and that sounds a lot more like an alligator than a yeah, human monster. So. I think that's not a human monster. Well, I want to take audience questions. We've got a few more minutes for that, so if you've got questions, Raise your hand. I don't think I can get to you with a mic, but I'll use the microphones and we'll repeat your questions. I'm going to start here right here. Are these animals, are these animals like um, increasing, stable, or decreasing? Yeah, how are their populations in the wild, do you know? That is a good question. Um, my understanding is that currently they're making a comeback, but... They, they were, in the past, hunted pretty heavily because they are a venomous reptile, and people generally don't get along with venomous reptiles very well. But the Gila monster, in particular, was actually the first reptile, or the first venomous reptile, ever to receive legal protection. Um, when was that? Yeah. I, sometime in the 1940s or 1950s, there was a law passed in Arizona making it illegal to harm or even to bother a wild Gila monster. And that law is so strong, these animals are so well protected, that if you encounter a wild Gila monster in Arizona, and you even just pick it up off the ground, you can go to jail and face a pretty heavy fine for that. Don't touch the Gila monsters. 
Um, is one of them bigger than the other? Yes. So the beaded lizard, by and large, is quite a bit larger than the Gila monster. Gila monsters, I, the maximum recorded length from the tip of the nose to the end of the tail is 22 inches. And that same figure of 22 inches is sort of on the small side of average for a beaded lizard. The largest beaded lizard, I believe, was it's either 38 or 42 inches from nose to tail. Do they eat crocodile eggs? You know, neither of these animals has a significant range overlap with crocodiles. So most of the places where you find crocodiles have lots of water. And most of the places where you find beaded lizards and Gila monsters don't have lots of water. And so I don't think that they would find crocodile eggs. And even if they did, the cool thing about crocodiles is that the mothers stay with the nest and protect the eggs. And I'm pretty sure that the crocodile would win the fight. Um, interestingly enough, they do eat a lot of tortoise eggs. And sometimes they'll get into fights with tortoises about that. And one scientist reported watching a Gila monster and a tortoise fighting for about four hours until they both got so tired they both gave up and nobody really won. Oh, wow. That's cool. Um, how old are they? Do you know how old these animals are? So that's a good question. I can tell you that this animal came to the museum in 2014, and that animal came to the museum in 2011. So the Gila monster has been here for seven years, and the beaded lizard has been here for four years, but I, we don't really know exactly how old they were when they got here, so I can tell you they're at least that old. Are they male or female? That's another tricky question. So there's actually no good way to tell from the outside. And a lot of the methods that we use to determine whether a lizard or a snake is male or female just don't seem to work on Gila monsters. Um, I've heard one person say that you know, the easiest way to tell is just by behavior. You put all of your lizards together and you watch them and the ones that wrestle each other are males fighting over the females, and the ones that don't take any part in that are the females. But we don't really have enough of them to try something like that. A lot of the techniques used are x-rays and um, ultrasounds, actually. If it's a female and it's going to lay eggs, you can see the eggs in an ultrasound before she lays them. But none of our animals have ever laid eggs, and we just don't know. It's hard to tell. Do you have a question? Come on up here. Um, do um, they have any, do they have long tails? Do they have long tails? You know, I'm noticing one has a much longer tail than the other. Is there a reason? Yeah, so the beaded lizard over here has this nice long tail that actually helps the animal climb trees. Kind of, um, if you've ever seen a picture of maybe a possum hanging by his tail, well, they're not quite that good at using their tails for tree climbing, but they do use their tails to help them move from branch to branch up in the trees. And since the Gila monster doesn't climb trees very much, his tail is almost entirely used for fat storage. You can see it's kind of like a big sausage there at the end of the animal. And that's really what it's for. It's to store energy because they come from an environment where they don't get to eat very often. So their tails are designed to help them where they live, how they find food, and how they survive. Mm -hmm. Or designed. They've adapted that way. Who else has a question? Second floor and third floors, you can ask questions too. Just wave me down. And if I see you waving, then you can yell your question at me. I'm looking around. Right, right in front of me. There it is. What is the lifespan of one of these animals? Oh, we got the egg. There we go. You can see this animal's probably about to start that process of tilting the egg back and, and trying to swallow it. And 
it'll still be mostly whole when he or she does. Uh, but as for their lifespan, that is also kind of a tricky question to answer. Um, I don't have an exact number off the top of my head, but I would guess somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 25 years on average. Probably quite different in captivity than in the wild. Do these animals have names? Besides beaded lizard and Gila monster, I think. <laughs> oh, no. um, so we, we don't actually name the vast majority of the animals here at the museum. Um, these animals do each have a unique identification number. The uh, beaded lizard's number is B36101. The Gila monster's ID number is B16101. Of course, here at the museum with almost all of our education animals, we don't actually give them names or like human names because we want these animals to remain ambassadors for their species in the wild. So it's much better from our point of view here in the museum if you fall in love with Gila monsters or with beaded lizards, rather than just falling in love with this Gila monster or that beaded lizard. So if you know you're gonna do something like join the friends of the museum and become a member and donate money to help us care for these animals, do research, and maintain the incredible collections we have here, it's a good thing to do. You're caring for these species in the wild and the programs that we have here at the museum to help educate more people about them and learn about them through scientific research so that we can protect them and their habitats in the wild. I'm looking around for more questions. Way up there, I see you waving at me. What's your question? What else do they eat besides eggs? So these animals are absolutely strict carnivores. They don't eat any plant material, but they will eat pretty much any animal that can't run away from them. Um, you notice that they have a little bit of trouble sometimes picking things up and they don't move very quickly. So what they're looking for is, say, if they find a mouse's nest where there are a lot of baby mice, they might eat those, but not the adults. Or if they find a bird nest where the eggs have already hatched, but the baby birds can't fly yet, then they might eat those baby birds. And in the case of the beaded lizard, their diet is a little broader in variety, they'll sometimes eat large insects if they can find those because they often will live in hollow spaces in rotten trees and there's lots of bugs in rotten trees. What happens if these animals go extinct? Well, one of the interesting things that's being done right now is that one of the populations of beaded lizards, so there are, let's see, there were four, five? I, I think there are four, or there were four subspecies of beaded lizard identified that may have recently been split or elevated to be full species. So there may actually be two or three or four species of beaded lizard now, but that's a very recent development. Um, but one of those species has actually, or one of those subspecies, has been selected by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums as a species that they should conserve, and a plan called a Species Survival Program Plan has been developed to help keep their numbers high in captivity. So there actually is sort of an agreement between different zoos and aquariums that have these animals that they should all breed them and share animals between each other and come up with pedigrees and lists of who should breed how many so that if the species goes extinct in the wild, we'll still have enough of them in captivity that they could potentially return to the wild one day. All right, everybody. Let's give Nick and Jeff a big round of applause to say thank you for sharing the animals with us today. Anything else that we absolutely have to know about these before 
we take them away. I think beaded lizards are a great example. Beaded lizards and Gila monsters both are a great example of why you don't necessarily need to be afraid of venomous reptiles. You can see these are just two big, goofy lizards. And while you definitely need to show them some respect, nobody needs to be deathly afraid of snakes or lizards in their yard. As long as these reptiles stay in nature where they belong, we can appreciate them and give them a little bit of space and get along with them just fine. I like it. Thanks, Nick. No Thank problem. you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out to Reptile and Amphibian Day here at the museum. Hope you enjoy the rest of your visit here at today's special event. Check out the museum. We've got one more presentation this afternoon at 3.30, all about ways that you can participate in science. That'll begin right here in the Daily Planet Theater in just a little bit. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next time.